morning all and welcome to this week's education session. I'm Sean Griffiths and I'm presenting on peripheral nerve injury and repair and some neurophysiological studies. Obviously this is a very broad topic so I've focused on some underlying concepts with some demonstrative examples. Peripheral nerve injuries are thankfully uncommon but they do have high morbidity and are frequently underdiagnosed. While they're present in approximately 2% of traumatic injuries, some reports suggest that less than 40% of these are diagnosed by the time of discharge. When present, there is a huge impact on the patient as far as needing physiotherapy, occupational therapy, or suffering from chronic pain. These factors also then mean there is a heavy burden on the hospital system for aftercare. Of peripheral nerves, the radial nerve is the most commonly injured motor nerve, occurring in 12% of humeral shaft fractures. The axillary nerve is also frequently affected in shoulder dislocations. The incidence of brachial plexus injuries, one of the most devastating of peripheral nerve injuries, is less clearly identified, but appears to occur in approximately 1% of polytrauma patients. The Seddon classification is what we're probably all the most familiar with from medical school. It's a simple grading published in 1943, gives an interpretation and a name to the degree of damage, which in turn helps to give a prognosis. Neuropraxia with damage to either or both of the myelin sheath and the axonal functioning uh, will uh, recover as the connective tissue sheath and the axon are still in continuity. Axonotmesis features destruction at the cellular level with loss of axonal continuity and the associated myelin sheath. The endo and perineurium sheaths may or may not be intact, giving rise to variable outcomes as it is a heterogeneous subset of injuries. Finally, neurotmesis features complete destruction and discontinuity. Spontaneous recovery of function is not expected without surgical intervention. Sunderland's classification from 1951 provides a slightly more detailed breakdown of pathology and was a development from Seddon's classification. The original classification had grades one through five as the magnitude of disruption increased. One, the axon is functionally impaired but intact as a result of disrupted microcirculation and focal myelin injury. This is really that classic neuropraxia injury. Two, there is loss of axonal continuity, but maintenance of the connective tissue integrity and recovery can be expected depending on the distance axons need to regrow. Three through to five have progressive disruption of the endoneurium, the perineurium, and ultimately the epineurium as the connective tissue structure of the nerve is disrupted. Grade six was added later by McKinnon and Delon in 89, to include nerves which have multiple levels and or grades of injury. One of the defining features of nerve injury is the degeneration of motor end plates after denovation occurs. This is due to the loss of trophic signaling between the nerves and the recipient cells. There's a time dependent degeneration of these synapses and their acetylcholine receptors with a loss of architecture, including the Schwann cell extensions that would previously guide regrowing axons and a change to the environment to where it does not support nerve regeneration. Previously, the point at which this becomes irreversible has variously been quoted as between six to 12 months. One recent neurosurgical article did serial muscle biopsies and found viable motor end plates at up to three years post-injury. These were only outliers at two of 18 patients, but it does suggest that human muscle behavior post denovation is different to animals and further studies may be required. The authors suggested that the possibility of biopsying target muscles to assess their viability for re innovation when planning any surgical interventions. Irreversible fibrosis develops over time as well, typically by about two years which does become an additional limiting factor to any surgical re -innovation. Penetrating injury can occur through sharp injury, such as lacerations or stabs, where a minimal zone of injury is present. 
can also occur through blunt open mechanisms such as gunshots, open fractures, etc., where a wider zone of injury will be seen. Compression and crush are common mechanisms we are aware of, and a direct pressure of 30 millimetres of mercury is enough to disrupt function and produce paresthesia. Of note, that is also the threshold that's utilised for diagnosis of compartment syndrome if using pressure monitors. 60 millimetres of mercury is sufficient to cause a complete block to conduction. Classic examples of compressive neuropathy would be carpal or cubital tunnel syndromes. Traction injuries uh, can vary from minor stretches where 8% stretch will interfere with microcirculation within the nerve, while a 15% elongation will cause disruption of axonal continuity. At the extreme, nerve root avulsions can occur, as can be seen in brachial plexus injuries. Classic examples here may be a common perineal nerve injury after correction of a valgus knee, or tardy ulnar nerve palsy after a supracondylar fracture. Iatrogenic injuries may cover any or all of these mechanisms, and we can easily cause lacerating pressure or traction injuries, and injuries can be local or distant to the operative field via traction or pressure. As with all assessments for pathology, a detailed history and physical examination is required. Mechanism will likely guide involved structures and the magnitude or pattern of injury to them. Particularly in polytrauma patients, performing an assessment based on both peripheral nerve distributions and dermatomes and myotomes can assist with differentiating the location of any injury to spinal or nerve root versus peripheral nerves. Serial physical exam is a key part of any observation or non-operative management phase, and ideally, the same person should do the physical exam each time to help standardise those findings. When assessing for recovery, tracking the advancement of a Tunnell sign can indicate regrowth along the course of a nerve. After a detailed history and physical examination, findings should be supplemented with objective investigations. EMG and nerve conduction studies are useful and are the only functional tool other than clinical examination. However, they can take a minimum of two weeks to reach maximum diagnostic potential when Wallerian degeneration is complete. They're also uncomfortable due to their use of needles and may be slow to get in the public healthcare system. As such, other techniques have been developed, including MRI and ultrasound. MRI is able to give a broad field of view, it's able to image nerves at any depth and is not affected by overlying structures such as bones. Ultrasound is able to give finer resolution of nerves at depths of less than 5 cm, it does not have any contraindications, and it has a higher sensitivity at 93% than MRI at 67%, with an equivalent specificity of 86% when assessing for peripheral nerve injury. Electromyography is effectively a study of the connection from nerves to muscles. A needle electrode is used to monitor activity within a muscle, both at rest and under voluntary control. It has three phases, being insertional as the needle enters the muscle, at rest without any voluntary activation, and under voluntary activity. In each phase, key findings can suggest underlying pathology. Insertional activity reflects the muscle's response to that first insertion of the needle. In acutely denervated muscles, hypersensitivity results from changes at the synapse or end plate, and this hypersensitivity leads to increased insertional activity, while in chronically denervated muscles with fibrosis and fatty atrophy, this is decreased. Uh, normal muscle then has no activity once at rest. Fibrillation in muscle fibres results from denervation, with the muscle fibre then depolarising spontaneously. Large numbers of these spontaneous single fibre discharges lead to that EMG finding of fibrillation. Positive sharp waves are the outcome of that same development of hypersensitivity, but the EMG needle is directly injuring the muscle fibre 
which triggers a single strongly detected depolarization. Fasciculations are larger discharges of part or all of a motor unit, hence a larger number of muscle fibres. These can be seen at the skin, but not necessarily. They're thought to arise within the distal arborization of a motor axon in the muscle and may occur in the setting of denovation, but are more often associated with neurogenic lesions such as radiculopathy or motor neuron disease. Nerve conduction studies are exactly as they sound. They objectively assess transmission of action potentials between two points using a stimulating and a monitoring electrode. There can also be transcranial magnetic stimulation of the motor cortex or magnetic stimulation of nerve roots. By measuring between two points, this allows localization of a pathology. Latency is the spread of the action potential transmission time from the fastest to slowest within the given nerve being tested. This reflects differing myelination of axons of differing sizes. Conduction velocities are less specific, but again, give a measure of altered function due to impact on individual axons and myelination, along with detection of regrowth where new fibers have slower conduction. Action potential amplitudes are the summary of action potentials arriving at the monitoring electrode, where there is summation or cancellation depending on the potentials arriving in or out of phase, or a decreased number of axons. Speed of transmission varies between nerve and with health of the nerve. One of the key points for electrophysiology is the ability to distinguish a conduction block, such as a complete Sunderland 1, where there is no signal transmission, but the terminal branches remain intact onto the motor end plate, versus axonal loss, e.g. Sunderland 2 and above, where Wallerian degeneration destroys the terminal arborization and denervation changes develop. To be able to improve upon the natural history of a pathology, we need to understand how nerves recover. Where the myelin sheath is the only structure injured, there's a decrease in volume of myelin and decreased distances between the nodes of Ranvier. These recover and return to normal over time if the insult is removed. A key example of this is chronic compression. Wallerian degeneration occurs distal to an axonal injury, and if the injury is close enough to a nerve body, this can also induce apoptosis. Where 30 to 40% of axons are injured, collateral growth and re is a key part of nerve regeneration from remaining axons to the end organ. Where larger numbers are damaged, regrowth from the cell bodies is required and is slow at approximately one millimeter per day. Regrowth does slow over time. It's dependent on the microenvironment and there being no occlusive scar. With a distance of maybe 45 centimeters from the brachial plexus to the forearm and 75 centimeters to the hand intrinsics, this translates to a prohibitively long period of 15 to 25 months before re will occur after a major brachial plexus injury. By this time, significant irreversible denervation changes will have occurred. So to look at nerve studies after a peripheral nerve injury, firstly, we need to wait for at least three weeks to allow for complete Wallerian degeneration. We then need to perform EMG and conduction studies. Findings may include increased latency or decreased conduction velocities reflecting demyelination. Altered insertional activity, fibrillation and sharp waves all reflect denervation. Decreased CMAP and SNAP amplitudes may reflect a loss of axons or simply conduction blocks. Complete blocks to conduction may reflect structural nerve destruction or functional conduction blocks. So, to run through a peripheral nerve injury we are familiar with, let's look at carpal tunnel syndrome. We know that it's a compressive neuropathy at a single site. As established before, the pressure must be overly over 30 millimetres of mercury to achieve a pathological compression, but we also know it must be below 60 mils of mercury because some transmission still occurs. 
Investigations will then be performed, including nerve conduction studies. These will test across the site of compression, which has damaged and decreased myelin, producing increased latencies and decreased conduction velocities. Studies of the whole limb will be performed because nerves are vulnerable to that double crush phenomenon and we seek to rule out any other concurrent pathology. Particularly if there's muscle wastage, an EMG can be performed. This will demonstrate any evidence of denervation within intrinsic muscles of the hand, while also ruling out other processes. Insertional activity may be decreased given the chronic nature, with fibrillation and sharp waves resulting from the denervation. With an isolated peripheral compressive neuropathy, our treatment will then be decompression. As we counsel our patients, if the denervation has been prolonged, muscle recovery will likely not be complete and our primary goal will be prevention of progression. However, we may also see some degree of recovery as we allow axons with Sunderland 1 type injuries to recover. Brachial plexus injuries are one of the most severe nerve injuries and can overlap between peripheral and central nerve injuries. They cover a spectrum of injury both in distribution and severity, from severe preganglionic avulsions to minor postganglionic traction injuries. Given the mechanisms involved, patients should be assessed for concurrent spinal cord injuries, which occur in up to 12% of patients and can be difficult to assess due to other concurrent changes in the upper limb. Thorough neurological assessment of the lower limb, including reflexes, is essential to assist with assessment of that cord. Identification of the injury nature is crucial, both for prognostication and management. Preganglionic injuries with avulsions proximal to the dorsal root ganglion are the most severe as there's detachment of the cell bodies from the central nervous system. Reinsertion is not feasible and regeneration will not occur. Postganglionic injuries with traction and rupture can be managed in similar ways to other equivalent peripheral nerve injuries. MRI can demonstrate nerve root avulsions or development of pseudo seal and can be performed from three weeks post injury. MRI has only a moderate diagnostic accuracy with an overall sensitivity of 39% with a specificity of 75%. This is worse for both of those at C5 to 6 and slightly better at the lower levels of C7 to T1. Neurophysiology of brachial plexus injuries can demonstrate the severity of injury and can be performed from three to four weeks post injury as Wallerian degeneration ceases and pathological changes in, the mus in muscle activity develop. Compound motor action potentials are compared to the contralateral side. If the injured side is decreased by 50 to 75 percent, this is rated as moderate injury. Greater than 75 percent is severe and absent reflects Seddon's axonotmesis or Sunderland grade 5 complete rupture. Sensory nerve action potentials or SNAPs are also measured. If these are present but function is absent, then this reflects a preganglionic injury as the peripheral nerve body and axon is intact, but its dorsal root ganglion attachment to the central nervous system is deficient. If the snap is absent, this reflects a postganglionic injury. However, it does not allow us to rule out the presence of preganglionic injury as well. At the early stages, Presence of motor unit action potentials in response to voluntary activation is reassuring for temporary injury, particularly if there are few fibrillations. As opposed, absence of action potentials with more fibrillation suggests permanent denervation. Serial examinations will show increased amplitude of motor unit action potentials with polyphasia in recovery. To take an upper brachial plexus injury as an example, this would have occurred most likely after a high energy caudal traction on the shoulder and plexus. Avulsions of C5 to 6 nerve roots would lead to irreparable dysfunction, particularly affecting elbow flexion. 
Nerve conduction studies in a severe case would show absent or severely decreased CMAPs and SNAPs. Muscles innervated by C5 and 6 would demonstrate increased insertional activity, fibrillation and sharp waves as a result of the denervation. Once this has been confirmed, nerve transfer or repair should be attempted. Elbow flexion is one of the most important factors to improve for a patient, hence the development of the Oberlin procedure. This makes use of intraoperative nerve conduction studies with combined motor action potentials to identify a fascicle within the donor, ulna and median nerves, which predominantly power wrist flexion. This is chosen as it's a relatively expendable action. After intranerve neurolysis and identification of the target fascicles, they're then transferred into the musculocutaneous nerve branches, which power biceps or brachialis. These have been denervated in the injury, and then they receive a new source of axons via the transfer. Regrowth and branching occurs, and ideally occurs and arrives before significant motor end plate or muscle degeneration occurs. Sharp open injuries with acute neurological deficits would typically include laceration or stab type injuries. These can be directly repaired if identified appropriately. Blunt or less well demarcated open injuries, such as open fractures, but also high velocity gunshot wounds and other mechanisms with large amounts of soft tissue injury. Early tagging and delayed repair means that the nerve ends can declare their true zone of injury, guiding resection as appropriate and ensuring that only a repair of healthy nerve is attempted at that later stage. If a nerve injury can be identified early, then direct repair may be appropriate. The fine details of the technique depends on the time frame and the gap present. Neurolysis proximal and distal can be utilised to mobilise nerves and allow a direct tension-free repair. Epineural repair is performed with an 8-0 non-absorbable suture and makes use of surface vessels as landmarks to assist with alignment. Fascicular repair makes use of further internal neurolysis and direct fascicular apposition, and intraoperative electrophysiology can also be used to guide reconstruction. This increased precision comes at the cost of increased scarring and operative time. As time progresses, any clean ends progressively develop stumps, which will need to be freshened up, later followed by retraction, which may prevent direct repair. If there is either destruction of a length of nerve or retraction, which prohibits direct repair, then the nerve repair should be supplemented. The best results are with autograft, and typical nerves used include the sural, superficial radial sensory, and lateral femoral cutaneous nerves, given the sensory nature of these and the low donor site morbidity. Grafts can be cabled, as is seen here, for donor recipient size mismatches and should be 10 to 20% longer than the gap to allow for fibrosis and shortening. Use of larger donor nerves may avoid the need for cabling, but instead you can run into problems with perfusion. A variety of other options for bridging gaps exist, include artificial or decellularized nerve conduits. Delayed or late surgery with exploration or grafts typically has poor outcomes. This is due primarily to the distances and times involved and the development of irreversible muscle and motor end plate degeneration and the loss of the early pro-regenerative environments. Neurolysis may have beneficial effects by dissecting out a traumatized nerve from any constricting scar tissue which may be acting to prevent recovery. At the microsurgical level, interfascicular neurolysis can also be performed with the idea of freeing up internal adhesions improving sliding and perfusion. However, again, this can be associated with increased scarring, so the risk versus benefit needs to be assessed. Neurolysis may also allow for identification of neuroma in continuity, being that Sunderland 4 injury where the epineurium remains intact, but there is severe internal destruction, and once identified, it allows for grafting if appropriate. If re-innovation is not achievable, but the 
residual deficit is problematic, then muscle or tendon transfers can restore some function. The technical details of any muscle transfers or tendon transfers vary with the exact injury and deficit, but the principles are to utilize a muscle or tendon unit that's redundant or non-essential, that would be synergistic to the lost function. Utilize a straight line pull and one tendon should only do one function. In conclusion, while nerve injuries are uncommon, we do need to improve our early detection of these, particularly when a mechanism occurs which we know is associated with an increased chance of injury. Appropriate early investigations, including ultrasound, can help guide patient care. Protocols for each pattern of injury do exist and should be followed. Where necessary, referral to subspecialist care should occur and should occur early enough to allow intervention before permanent degeneration occurs. Here are some of the references. Thank you for your time.